Dallas. I hear it doesn't rain much here, so sorry about that. I brought it with me. Uh, no, this is really fun for me. So I don't do these sorts of like stand and deliver uh, presentations very much, but I do have a slideshow. I think maybe the first slide will come up if I hit this button soon, maybe. Um, but basically, I'm told basically everyone in this room is a creator in some way, if that's, is that correct? Am I correct. accurate about that? Okay, perfect. Um, and Samsung asked me if I wanted to come speak about my creator journey and being a creator. And I've done this a lot in like various blips or like snippets or even talked to Colin and Samir about it on, on YouTube a bit, but I've never like just gone through all of the realizations I've had, all of the light bulb moments that I've had uh, all at once for people. And I think this would be valuable. So this is, this is what I'm gonna try to do in this presentation. But I think there's also Q&A after this, which I think will be the most useful version of like specific feedback and answers that I can help people with. But this is, uh, this is exciting to, to actually do it. So we're gonna start now. I don't know if this, the slides are gonna show up. I'm gonna hit this slide. Uh, oh, my slides are in the back, all right. So maybe they won't show up at the, at the front. That's fine, okay. <laughs> so the first thing I wanna say is I love analogies. So my favorite way of explaining something that I don't understand or having it explained to me is by having it anal, anal, analogy mapped to something that I do understand. So one of my favorite analogies that I'll start with is I kind of view being a professional creator kind of like being an athlete, a professional athlete. There are a lot of similarities uh, between the two. Uh, and if you talk to athletes, you'll hear a lot about the same stuff. So let's take a professional NBA player. Very common to like want to be a professional NBA player, but very rare to actually get to be a, does anyone know how many NBA players there have ever been, ever? Less than 5,000 NBA players ever to play in the league, uh, but, there are a lot of people who play basketball in the park, a lot of people who play basketball in school, who play basketball in college for fun, and a lot of those people watch the NBA, a lot of those people play basketball in an attempt to get good enough to play in the NBA. And I think a lot of the same thing applies to being a creator. There are a lot of uh, people who go do these polls where they go to schools and elementary schools and middle schools and they ask kids, what, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And a surprising amount of them, maybe it's not surprising because you guys already know, but a lot of them say they want to be a YouTuber. And that used to be like firefighter or like policeman or other things like that, but they want to be a YouTuber now. Um, and I think a lot of the same parallels actually apply where you actually kind of have to enjoy playing basketball in the park in the creator sense, which means number one, you're playing for free. <laughs> you're kind of just doing you're expressing yourself creatively in ways that make sense to you because they're fun. Um, and you're doing a lot of things the same way that the professional creators are doing, but just sort of as an ex a creative expression for yourself. Um, and then there is a select, a small group of the most talented, the, the hardest working, the most lucky in a lot of cases that end up getting to be a professional creator and get to that top of the mountain. And that is really exciting but takes a lot of work and there's that whole journey to get there. So that's one of my favorite analogies is comparing uh, creators to athletes. Um, there we go. But I think uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take it back to the beginning of my journey. Oh, it is behind me. Did that just show up? <laughs> Has that been behind me the whole time? Oh, that's even better. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Here we go. My story, I wanna take it back to the beginning of how I started making YouTube videos. And some of you might already know this, but I'll go through. So I make tech videos. I make videos about tech products, about technology. I talk to tech people, I interview people. And this all started back in 2009. So I was a uh, child in high school, basically. And I was saving up my precious allowance money and wanted to know what laptop should I buy with my precious $5 a week allowance from raking leaves and taking out the trash. And so I basically watched every video on YouTube that I possibly could about every laptop that ever existed to find which one I should buy. I looked at all the specs, watched every video, 
and I eventually landed on the HP Pavilion DV7T. And uh, so, so I, yeah, I did the thing that like nerds do in school where they like make a PowerPoint for their parents and I'm like, okay, mom, dad, here's the reasons why I should spend the money on this laptop, that one right there. Um, and they were like, yeah, okay, you know, if you really believe in it, go for it. So I was like, yes, I watched every video, time to do it. So we did it, I got the laptop and when I got it, I took it out the box, I started using it and I actually started finding some things that I didn't see in all of those videos that I'd watched, which was kind of weird. Uh, so it kind of felt like the natural thing to do was to flip open the laptop, turn on the webcam, and make a video about the things that I'd found so that the next kid who was gonna be in my shoes buying a laptop, watching every video in existence for their precious allowance money to get their laptop, would have more information to choose from. So that was that video. All right, welcome to my first video. Um, bought a new laptop and I it's an HP Pavilion DV7T so of course I got the uh, two minutes 51 seconds of me uh, talking about the Windows Media Center remote that I found as a surprise in the PCI slot on the side of the laptop it was crazy I had to show people so you can tell that a kid like that who would, who would turn the video camera on and make a video and not think twice about it and post it on YouTube probably kind of a weird hobby, but turns out that that's something that kid likes doing. That kid would play basketball in the park. That kid's not thinking too much about being the athlete on stage as much as he's just like, ah, I kind of enjoy the craft. Um, so that was the very beginning. That was uh, the first video I uploaded. So that kind of takes me to my first light bulb moment. Hi guys. Which... Hi guys, I'm gonna do a video now on Safari for Windows. Uh, this is Okay, first of all, Internet Explorer. I making out a ton of videos back in 2009, and this was a couple months into my first weeks of making videos, and I made a video, which was a tutorial, on downloading and installing Safari, the browser, for Windows the day that it came out. Apple made an announcement. They said, you can download our browser and put it on Windows. I said, that's pretty cool. So I made this video explaining how to download it, why you would want to download it, what it was good at, what it was bad at, it's a kid in high school in his bedroom doing a video. And I had a couple dozen subscribers at the time. I went to sleep, I woke up the next day, and I think that video had like a thousand views. And that was a lot at the time on YouTube. Uh, and it kind of was like this light bulb moment that, oh, people really care about timely, valuable information, useful information in a timely manner. I didn't actually know that until I'd uploaded this video. It was something I actually had to figure out in the moment. And so that was a light bulb moment, not just because I make tech videos and this was a tech realization of that, but I think the, the version of this that kind of applies to everyone is the word value. Actually finding what the value is of what you're making for people to actually watch it. And there's a lot of definitions of value. Uh, I watch a lot of videos just for pure entertainment value. That's one version of value. Um, I think a lot of people might watch tech videos because they are going to make a purchase soon and they want to know more about the thing that they're about to buy, and so that's value. They get to see it in someone's hands like it's in their own hands. Um, but a lot of the value from, from these platforms and for what you guys are making and for what we're all trying to make um, is in a combination of all these things. It's entertainment value, it's all kinds of other value. And I actually encourage you to try to have that first light bulb moment of actually being able to define what the value is of what you're making. It probably is a combination of the things too, by the way. It's probably entertainment. It's probably someone who's looking to learn something. Maybe you make product videos. Maybe you make just comedy sketches, all sorts of things like that. There's some type of value uh, to help you connect your audience and help you be useful to your audience. So that's my first light bulb moment in speed running through light bulb moments for me. So the second, I think that sort of helps me understand for myself what I'm doing and maybe can also be helpful to you is I always ask myself, why did I make this? Or why am I about to make this? And this literally came from like an old YouTube comment of someone going, 
this video was pointless, why did you make this video? And then me going, yeah, it was pointless, why did I make this video? And I have to actually think about why am I making this video? Because uh, at the time I was just cranking out videos for fun and not really thinking too hard about it, but I actually had to have, again, that second sit down with myself, that conscious thought of like, okay, why, why am I making this particular video? Is this specifically for audience growth maybe? Is this video specifically because I really like this browser and I wanna share it with people? Is this video specifically for the kid who's about to buy this laptop who's in my shoes? Why am I making this video? And it's actually more important I think now than ever because there are infinitely more things to watch now. And so if you want to not only be valuable but to give people a reason to watch what you're making, assuming it's a video of some kind, uh, then really thinking about why am I making this and why are people going to watch what I'm making and having that answer as you're making it, I think is actually super, super important. All right, light bulb moment number two. Uh, so I'm making videos, I'm sort of cranking out software videos and tutorials and I'm figuring out my footing on YouTube and what I want to do. And let's see here. There we go. My, my sort of network of places that I'm uploading is starting to grow a little bit. And uh, this, is, this might be kind of a hot take or a controversial version of this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, which is that I think that the best content on each of these platforms is the content that is native to, native to designed for that platform. Now, one of the early pieces of advice I see a lot of people get, especially when you're a fledgling creator or really starting to grow as a creator is, oh, you should be everywhere. You should be on all of these platforms but we're only one person, how do you, I can't make a YouTube video and a Twitch stream and a TikTok and an Instagram reel, that's a lot to do. So we'll make one piece of content and then sort of slice it up and fit it into these different puzzle pieces as best we can. And to an extent that does work, and I still do that for Facebook, and I think that's fine sometimes, but I think there's a, a real distinct advantage in making your content native to that platform, meaning it's actually specifically made for that platform. This obviously takes extra work, and this obviously takes extra bandwidth, but when you see an Instagram reel or when you see a TikTok that's not just a YouTube video sliced up from last week, but is actually someone using the TikTok features or doing the green screen thing or using a trending sound or, or using a popular meme or something like that. There's something about it, it's, it's hard to define exactly what it is, but it does help you connect better and helps that piece of content work better on that platform. Again, this is just a, one of the many things that I've found in my making lots of videos and lots of pieces of content for various platforms, but I've done a lot of both versions of this and I do think that that has helped a lot, especially when connecting with an audience is a priority. Okay, new light bulb moment. Uh, you're gonna start making a lot of stuff and as you're making a lot of stuff, I think there is a, a pretty common realization which is you watch a lot of stuff too. And at some point your, your skill level gets up to here and then your taste of what you're watching is above your skill level. And so you end up thinking like, man, I wanna make what I'm making better to match what I'm watching. I want to get better, I wanna improve my skills to make better stuff. And so there's this little gap and you start to close that gap and then the goalpost moves and it goes higher again and then you see even better stuff and you wanna make your stuff even better. So that moving goalpost I think is actually a good thing. I don't know, I mean I've been making videos for 16 years, something like that. Um, and you never reach that goalpost of thinking, I've made the perfect video, I've done it. It's, just, it's not gonna happen. That's not a feeling you really get. But I think that growth of constantly being able to look backwards and say, you know that thing that I made a year ago, I would have done it differently if I did it again this time. I would have done it better if I did it again this time. I think the fact you can actually look back at your old stuff and see improvement over time will always be a thing. And if you look back to a year old video and you think that you'd probably make the same video today, that actually probably means you're not getting better. And so having that in the back of your head as you continue to improve, I think is worth keeping in mind. Okay, new analogy. I love analogies. Uh, I think that being a creator is like being an octopus. 
This is also, Dolly made this, by the way. Could you tell? It's AI. It's not a real octopus. I couldn't use copyrighted images, so. Um, being a creator is like being an octopus. So why do I say that? So when you're a creator, you, you do a lot of things, you wear a lot of hats, you kind of have a lot of jobs. Not only are you in front of the camera, you're also the camera person behind the camera, you're also the writer, you're also the content manager and the content strategist, but you're also running the inbox, you're also the financial accountant, you're also in the comment section engaging on social media, you're doing all these jobs that could be individual things, whether you're a video editor or a producer or you're doing lighting, you're doing sound, it's a lot. That's eight different arms that are all doing different things at the same time. And so, you kind of end up feeling like an octopus, and this is a pretty unique stage in the, in, the, in the life cycle of a creator, where you get to be doing so many things that you actually start to realize, hmm, I think I'm gonna need some help with this. And not everybody ends up deciding to take it like this, but if you are that octopus and you feel like there are certain things that if you could maybe, maybe detach one of the arms and hand it to somebody, and they could do that task even better than you. Here, look at this next, look at this next slide. <laughs> so that's Dolly also. <laughs> so if you could detach that arm and hand it to somebody, and they could do that job better than you ever could, that that would free up a lot of your time to be doing the things that you really wanna be doing. So let's say it's camera work. Let's say it's editing, for example. This is one of the most common things. You make videos, and you really enjoy making videos, and you shot them on your phone, and you imported them, but you've got three to make today, and if somebody could edit two of them while you spend time on the third one, that would be cool. So let me just have them spend time on editing. And this is something Jimmy, Mr. Beast, has told me a thousand times, which is like, he literally would ask me, Marquez, how much time do you spend on editing? I'd say, I don't know, 20% of my time. And he would go, okay, so take that 20% of your time, remove it, give it to someone else, have them spend 100% of their time on it, there's no way they don't get better at it than you, and then you just freed up 20% of your time and your editing just got better. So teamwork kind of makes the dream work. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but here's the, the second half of that analogy, which is octopi also have three hearts. Anybody knew that? Octopi have three hearts. And that's actually a part of uh, being a creator and, and finding what you want to cut off and what you want to keep is on this creator journey, you've got all these things that you're doing and all these arms and you cut them off and you hand them to people and they do that thing better than you. But you'll always have a couple of things that you have to keep for yourself that it turns out are like the core of what you actually do. Uh, whether that's being on camera or content strategy or the writing or the, or the jokes that you tell or the style or the specific thing. Some parts of them will always be you. Also, octopuses are extremely smart. I could go into that analogy forever, but the idea is there are some things that you need to find that are for you. If you're unlucky, or if you're maybe lucky like me, you'll cut one of them off and then realize, oh, that wasn't one of the ones I should cut off, and you take it back, and you realize that that's part of the core. So for anybody looking into, into teamwork or into getting help, it's kind of the way I think about it. Uh, some other realizations in this speed run. Um, I also kind of liken making videos to driving for Uber. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. You're actually, you're, we're working on someone else's platform a lot of times, assuming you don't own YouTube or Instagram. Um, and as you're getting started, it feels like you're driving for Uber because you don't have enough of a back catalog of content uh, to continue to work for you when you stop. So when you stop driving for Uber, that's it. You've stopped working. The income stops, the work stops, the growth stops, everything stops until you get back to work. Uh, and I think that's really how I think about uh, this really unique balance of quality versus quantity. So really, really early in my YouTube career, I was just cranking out videos, to be honest. I was making tons of videos, not thinking too hard about the quality of the videos, because it was just fun, and it wasn't a job yet, and it was just what I enjoyed doing. And so the, the slider on quality versus quantity was way more towards quantity, as I was just sharpening my tools and getting better at making things. But I think um, slowly over time, as you build up a back catalog and you get better at making things, 
then that slider goes towards quality a little bit. And I think that's a good thing. I also think it can be useful to uh, think about each project uh, a little bit on that realm of quality versus quantity because not everyone is on the same place on the slider. Uh, and then this, also another way of thinking, this is another little slider you can come up with, which is every piece of content, and this especially applies to me in tech, but I'll just show it to everybody anyway. Uh, every piece of content lives somewhere on this spectrum of evergreen or time-sensitive content. So if I review the iPhone 14 Pro, where does that go on this timeline? That's pretty, I think that's closer to like next year who's watching that video, right? It's all the way over here. But if I'm just talking about smartphones or cameras in general, suddenly we're, we're kind of further over here. And this is in the area of back catalog that actually works for you after you're done with it. Um, this is another thing you, you kind of have to be deliberate about thinking about. For me, I kind of alternate between these two types of videos. I think for some of you, maybe you're right down the middle with some of the videos. You're thinking about maybe trying to make more evergreen stuff or maybe leaning more into the memes or the time sensitive or the, the today stuff. Just think, just keep this in the back of your head. This is another one of those like deliberate sit down moments of going, where am I putting my content on this, this sliding scale here? Because this is a, it's more important than the, more important than you think to the growth and the overall getting out of it feeling like driving for Uber. Okay, last bit. I wanna talk about collabs, because I think collabs are important. And we're also here in a room full of creators, and I think, I think we all understand the value of community and collaborations. Now, take what advice you want from me, someone who has collaborated with some of the most, let's say, controversial people on the internet. <laughs> so you can, you can choose to take advice from me or not on collabs if you want, but my <laughs> advice on collabs is uh, to try to actively make everyone a win-win-win. Now what is a win-win-win? Why is that three instead of two? Uh, a win-win-win, first it's a win for you specifically, and think about going into a collab thinking like, if I can make something out of this that I could not have made myself, or I can express myself creatively or work with this person and do something I couldn't have made by myself, then that's a win. And then it's also try to make it a win for them in that same way, something that they can, something they can make that they could not have made without you. And then a third win for the audience, because at the end of the day, you're making something for them to watch, for them to enjoy. And if you are able to make a better video or a better piece because of the collaboration, then that is a win too. This also applies to content, sorry, this also applies to collaborating with brands. So collaborating with people, collaborating with brands, all of that, this, uh, this sort of structure lives in my head every time something pops up in the inbox, hey, do you wanna collaborate? Hey, or if I'm reaching out to someone who wanna collaborate on something, I have an idea. This is always in the back of my head with every version of that is the win, win, win all the way around. Um, and then the last sentiment, this is a fun one. Uh, collaboration kind of just works for everyone. I think one of the, the most valuable lessons I've learned being a creator uh, is hanging out with other creators and especially creators that are doing similar things to you. So a little story about this is uh, Apple invites a lot of YouTubers to their events now. It wasn't always like that. Samsung invites a lot of YouTubers to their events now. It wasn't always like that. I remember when I was the only YouTuber at some of these tech events. And then the next year there were five, the next year there were nine, the next year there were 12, and then 30, and then suddenly it's all YouTubers. And I think we go to these events and we're hanging out with other tech, when I'm making tech videos, I'm hanging out with other tech YouTubers and we're holding the camera for each other and we're all collaborating and then we all hang out after and we talk about these things. And it turns out it's really valuable to be friends with and, and actually associate with everyone who's doing the same type of stuff as you because we're all kind of on the same page. I think a rising tide lifts all boats makes a lot of sense here. Um, I also get asked sometimes like, oh, who's your biggest rival? And, or something, I don't, I don't have one. We kind of all are doing the same thing in the same way. Maybe the, maybe the old tech media would consider themselves a rival, but I feel like uh, we're all learning from each other's 
uh, experiences and mistakes at the same time. So put it like this. If I make 100 videos, my 101st video is going to have the learnings of those 100 videos. If I have 10 friends who all make the same type of video, and they all make 10 videos, we all make 10 videos together, then all of us, if we talk and we learn from each other and we all go back and forth on what worked and what didn't work and what helped and what didn't help, my 11th video will have the learnings from 100 mistakes. Everyone's mistakes, everyone's learnings, all of our 11th videos will be as good as the one person by themselves on their 101st video. So if, if I get, if you can take anything from this blabbering presentation, it's that I think being actually collaborative and, and you know, talking with people in this room and, and with other creators is super valuable if we actually do learn from each other. And I think that's probably my best tip. So I'll end it at that, and I think Q&A will be good. That was fantastic. Thank you. So good to have you. Yep. We have some questions for you. Are you ready? I am excited. Well, first, the octopus. How did you uh, make that happen? The images? Or yes. The, oh, I, I asked Dolly uh, for an image of an octopus holding a camera, and it gave me a bunch of them, and that was actually the easiest part of, of just getting those images. It's, I love it. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. Yeah. Um, we have some actual questions now. Okay, perfect. Um, so the first question is, how do you process and bounce back from negative comments? Okay, so I think there's two types of negative comments. One are the useless negative comments, and you know exactly the ones I'm talking about. If you upload to YouTube, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and two is the actual constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the most useful feedback, which is constructive criticism, gets packaged in a weird way that's like begging for attention and overly extreme. <laughs> but I think when you actually you know, dig down to the bottom of that actually useful piece of constructive criticism, you can actually make your content better. And I don't take it too personally. When people have real feedback, a lot of people go, oh, well, you don't make videos, so I can't take feedback from you. But I think when people watching videos have feedback, it's useful to listen to that feedback if you wanna make videos for those types of people. So I don't think of it as bouncing back so much as learning from it and hopefully mm -hmm. taking all those learnings and making it better. And like I said, collaborating with people, we all get those types of comments and we learn from them all the time. And you personally read through each one of them to kind of know how things are resonating. Yep. That's yep. incredible. I used to have uh, YouTube used to send an email for every activity on the channel. So when I first signed up, every new subscriber was a new email and every new comment was a new email. Oh. And there was also this thing back in the day called channel comments. I don't know if any of you guys remember that era of YouTube with video responses. Never mind. Uh, I got an email for every one of those. And so every day I'd get home from school and I'd open up my inbox and I'd go through and I'd read and answer every single one of those emails. Every comment, every message, every channel comment. And I would go through every subscriber and leave a channel comment saying, thanks for subscribing. What are you here for? I had to stop after a while because that got a little crazy. Um, but I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about what people actually were subscribing for, about what they thought about the videos, and that all went into the growth, making it better. I love that. So one of the one of the uh, ways in which you have been introduced is as the OG content creator, right? So you've been around, you've seen some things. Mm -hmm. What do you think today are some of the most common uh, misconceptions about being a, co a content creator? Um, what are the most common misconceptions? I think one of them, I'll be in the, like the back of a taxi and they'll be like, so what do you do? And then you kind of have to like think about what you're gonna say. <laughs> and I'll say, I make tech videos online. And I think a lot of uh, the common misconceptions right off the bat are like, oh, so you just like, it just like rocketed off, like you started from zero and then boom, you're just here now. Like you just make this, this is immediately your job. Mm. And I think that kind of like forgets the 1500 videos that went into getting it off the ground into creating what you have. Um, so I think a common misconception is that you can just snap your fingers by a camera and like you're just doing it. And I think uh, there, there has to be some amount of learning and struggle and creation and growth to get to doing what you do. Um, 
And it's kind of surprising how many people don't really, because you can kind of just get into some jobs now. You can, I mean, you go through school and you, you kind of apply and then you get in and that's your job. But I think the path to what we do is kind of misunderstood. I love it. Do you, um, do you also find yourself, like, have you simplified your process, like your setup as you've evolved your content creation? Is it, you know, the eight arms and eight cameras type of thing? Or yeah. what are you using these days? Um, it's, it's both simpler and more complicated. Uh, I think it's simpler because I understand it now better than I ever have. But it's more complicated now because, like I said, I make tech videos. Um, there are a lot of tech channels on YouTube. You can watch any video on the new phone when it comes out. Why would you watch mine? So there's an extra layer on top of like complexity and trying to make this video stand out and be more valuable, which mm -hmm. takes a lot of thought and care. Uh, so it's a little, yeah, it's a little bit of both. It's more complicated and simpler. <laughs> Hopefully you're using S23 Ultra, S23 Ultra for uh, that 8K resolution. <laughs> Um, uh, the last thing, uh, what is the biggest piece of advice you can give to someone who's just starting out? That's maybe the number one FAQ. What type of advice can you give someone starting out? I think, again, don't expect it to, to start fast. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to be the basketball player in the park for a while. Don't expect it to turn into immediately what you were picturing. There will be a gap between your skill and your taste. Like all the stuff I talked about has to be real for a while. Um, and then you eventually work your way into turning it into what you were picturing when you started. So I think my advice is expect a lot of work to go into it mm -hmm. and hopefully you can see that progress over time and be motivated by it. Love that, amazing. Well, we have a room full of people. So does anybody have any questions for Marquez? <laughs> Incredible. Um, so when you were talking about hiring or like giving somebody a tentacle, as you said, um, how do you figure out how long or at what point when you said taking the tentacle back and realizing it was like a main core thing that you need, how do you know at what point whether you just haven't given it long enough or it has to be a core thing? And how do you personally decide how much that extra time would be worth for you to make it even worth hiring out versus doing yourself? Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess if I go back to that conversation with, with Jimmy and with Mr. Beast in the car, uh, you kind of have like a pie chart of like how your time is spent. And I think if you, if you were to like literally make that chart for yourself, you can identify the pieces that you wish you weren't spending so much time on, and those are kind of the first ones you naturally would try to get help with. Um, and then once you actually get the help, I think it's really just a process of defining really early what you want to get out of that. Do I want to get time back? Do I want to get, do I want to level up something? I remember there were different goals when hiring a video editor, for example. The goal was to get time back. I, I really know my style, I'm locked in. I want to teach her to edit kind of like I edit now. And then that's a lot of time that I get back to do other things. Or if it's writing, for example, I'm stuck in a rut, I've done a lot of the same types of videos for a while. Maybe I want to level this up. I have to define very early, okay, I want to get help specifically so we can start to move around on that spectrum and try different types of things and see how we can do there. And once you know that definition in your head, then you start to try things and you can decide for yourself if it's working, if it's not working. Amazing. Another question? Hi. Um, I. Your stuff's amazing, but I just was curious, what is the favorite video that you've ever made and why? That's tough, okay. So I have a hard time looking at my old videos. Like I love the older videos that I made because they got me to where I am, but I always have this recency bias of like, well, the last video is kind of the best one because that's all the effort of all the learnings and everything that went into it. Um, I think the interview that I did with Kobe Bryant has a soft spot in my heart mm -hmm. because number one, that was the first interview I ever did with anyone ever as like a trembling 12 year old at Staples Center and it's Kobe Bryant in his farewell mm -hmm. season and he's giving me the time to do an interview about the tech in his shoe. And he's been interviewed by other people for 20 years. So he did a good job of making me look like a good interviewer but I'd never interviewed anyone before. And so that was the sort of launching point for doing other interviews, which is super cool. Mm. 
So I, I would say that that's probably my favorite video ever, but then it's, it's just the new videos, yeah. Another question? With everyone that you work with already, you work with so many phenomenal people, so many great people, is there anyone you would still fangirl over or like would still <laughs> dream to work with? Uh, interesting. I, so I have a lot of respect for a lot of other creators that I have not gotten to work with yet. And I was called an OG YouTuber. I got to push back on that a little bit. I started in 2009, but there are a lot of creators that I've been watching since 2007, 2006, who are like the, 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 the real OGs, I would say. So that's the Rhett and Lynx, the Smoshes, the Igestines, the people who came before me that are all still doing it, which is mm -hmm. sick. Um, and then I also, I, I watch a lot of sports, so I kind of have this like other soft spot for like athletes who are really cerebral and carefully considered in what they do. Obviously there's people dunking on everyone, that's cool, but like the players who play, like, who are like built like me, who still like dominate, which is kind of cool to watch, I kind of, I like, I like picking their brain a little bit, so I feel like that's a little bit of the, the sauce for me too. All right. We had another question. So your channel is all about, you know, tech reviews and stuff like that, and I'm pretty sure you watch others, but are there also other uh, type of videos that you love to watch on YouTube? Oh, I watch all kinds of videos, yeah. You should see my sub box right now. I'm subscribed to like 100 something channels on YouTube. It's everything from interviews to podcasts to car videos to whatever. I kind of just watch a lot of YouTube in general, and I think that helps a lot because I make YouTube videos. I'm sure people who make who stream on Twitch watch a lot of Twitch. I think people who make TikToks watch a lot of TikToks. It helps. I have a Netflix account. I don't remember the last time I logged in, to be honest. Like I watch, I'm, I'm in YouTube and the variety of it. So yeah, all over the map. And then we had one more on this side. So I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. You influence every purchase that I have ever <laughs> made with phones. Okay. So when I found out that I was going to be here, and I knew you were going to be here, I bought this skin yeah. from my S23 Ultra. You might know what it is. The icons, yep. Yeah, I yep. wanted to know if you could sign it later. I could, I could definitely do that. All right, thank you. I could definitely do that. He'll sign it. I will. <laughs> I'll sign whatever. I've signed, I've signed crazy things, by the way. People, I, I, I talked at my college uh, not that long ago because they were like, you want to come back and talk to the kids? And I was like, yeah, I kind of do. I'll, I'll do that. That's awesome. And I signed somebody's like iPad just on the metal, just right on the back of it. I don't know if that was a good idea or not, but I did it. So I'll sign it. <laughs> did we have one more question? Amazing. All right. So I know we've got some more programming coming up. Thank you so much, Marquez. Thank you, guys.